That's all right. What happened? We're good. I don't know. All right. <laughs> all right, I'm here, guys. Don't worry. All right, a little bit of technical difficulties, but that's okay. I'm excited. Yeah, I hope you guys are excited too. We got a great class today. So welcome everyone into the Wells Tech Garage. Today, we are going to be talking about our last class of fuel trims. Finally, we're finally going to be concluding, I know I said this last week, but concluding our fuel trims class with a case study on our Colorado. And as you guys can see behind me here, we also have a 3 Series Beamer in the shop today. So before we get into the vehicles at hand, we have to do our question of the class. And I can't call it a t-shirt question anymore because you guys already know we're giving away hats now. And it seems like you guys are loving them. I've gotten some pictures from you guys and some emails. In fact, uh, one of you guys actually sent me an email back saying that the hat's doing a good job. His wife was actually hitting on him with the hat on. So if you want your wife to hit on you, answer the question accurately. Win one of our hats, put it on, and you're good to go. So the question for today is going to be another one of those complex makes you think question just like our EGR one was last week. The question is a vehicle with a stuck open purge solenoid, EVAP purge solenoid, stuck open. Technician A says that vehicle will have rich codes. Technician B says that vehicle will have lean codes. Who is correct? Tech A, Tech B, neither or both and it's not just A, B, C, or D this time, guys. I also want why. Why is one correct or why is the other correct? Why? Give me the answer and why. And then you win one of these awesome, super sexy, stylish hats that will help your wife uh, to hit on you. Okay? So awesome. Let's get into what we have here. Now, I want to start with the BMW today, guys. We're not going to do a ton on there, but I want to share a story. And um, you guys, a couple of you guys have said that you want to see more European stuff. So this just happened to come in. Um, this is actually one of our Wells mobiles that our engineers actually do some testing on. But behind me here, I got some pictures. This is a 2003 Beamer 3 Series 325i with the uh, 2.5 liter straight six motor in there. Uh, there's the motor. And now guys, I don't know about you, but personally I'm slightly apprehensive when it comes to working on European vehicles. I know some of you guys out there, we've talked, you're very proficient on European vehicles. I come from a uh, background of domestic vehicles mostly. I started at an independent garage where there used to be a Pontiac garage, so I started there. Then went to a Ford and Kia dealership, so I got some, some Korean um, skill, I guess, and domestic. But Europeans have always been something to me that's been a little bit more difficult to work on. And I apologize for the noise, guys, if you can hear that humming sound. They're actually doing some excavating work out there, burying some pipes. So uh, that may continue through, through the entire broadcast, I'm sorry. Um, okay, back to Europeans. The reason why I'm slightly apprehensive when it comes to European models is, first of all, I don't have the equipment here in front of me currently to get into the uh, manufacturer specific side. I don't have any European scan tools. Our Varus here does not have the European package. So I'm apprehensive that way. And then also service information and diagrams. I mean, we've all struggled through them. VW, Audi, uh, Volvo, BMW, Mercedes, all those vehicles, the diagrams and service information kind of suck. Okay. We all kind of know that unless you're used to doing it, you're proficient at it and you have the proper tools and equipment. Now that being said, does every BMW or every Audi or every Mercedes that comes into your shop, does it need to be turned away because it's a European and you don't have the equipment? Well, this is a success story as to why you don't need to turn those away. It could be potentially be something easy and you could be turning money away. And as a business, you never want to turn money away. So what I've done is I snapped some pictures along the way of what I did on this BMW. So here, is a snapshot of me going into the generic side of the scan tool. Now again, I don't have vehicle specific uh, capabilities for this 03 BMW. So I went in generic, you can see all the information I have in here. You can get current data, freeze frame, trouble codes, clear emissions related data, display, test parameters, onboard systems, VIN and performance tracking. If you're not familiar with this side of the scan tool, we do have a class that we did last fall on the generic side of the scan tool. Okay, so next step was this thing had a check engine light on, so I pulled codes. And right away, generic side, you can see a P0174, 
171 and a 158. Looks like normal codes, right? Just because it's a BMW doesn't mean a lean code is something different than a lean code. A lean code on that, that Beamer back there, same as a lean code on this, the same as a lean code on a Ford. There's no difference to them. It's a generic code and it says the engine is running lean. There's excessive oxygen going past our oxygen sensor. Simple, right? So why should we diagnose it any differently? There's nothing different about this diagnostic. So we have a 171, a 174, and a 158. Now we have lean codes and an oxygen sensor code. Which one do we go after first? Well, that depends on freeze frames and live data and a little bit of experience. It's possible our O2 sensor could cause our lean condition or our lean condition could cause our O2 sensor, <coughs> excuse me, our O2 sensor problem. Now, what I did next was I went into our freeze frames to see when this problem occurred. Now, I only had one freeze frame and it was for the P0171 code. You can see we have engine speed at 2000 RPM, closed loop, Coolant temp, the vehicle's warm, and look at our fuel trims. Short term and long term are both positive trims, meaning we are adding fuel to this engine as we're going down the road at 50 miles per hour and 18% calculated load. Now, 18% isn't very high. The throttle is just barely being pressed. 2,000 RPM is not very high. I would compare this similarly to an idle condition, um, and we can prove that out really easily by just firing up this car and watching live data. And you can do that from the generic side of the tool. Now, I wish I would have thought ahead and taken a video of that generic side of the, the uh, live data before I replaced the parts, but unfortunately I did not. I have live data of it after the fix that I'll show you guys here in just a minute. But it's neither here nor there. At this point, I fired up the vehicle and I watched the fuel trim levels at idle. And what happened? They went up. Our long terms were high, our short terms were high, and they were continuing to get higher. Okay, so what does that tell me? Well, we talked about it last week when we worked on our GTO, that we could have a vacuum issue. If I would increase the throttle, reduce engine vacuum, the problem would lessen. It would become not as bad, leading me even more towards a vacuum problem. Now, again, I don't have any BMW equipment, so I used what I have at my disposal. My eyes, my ears, and a flashlight. Everybody should have those from day one of fixing cars. And what I found is the second I popped the hood, I could hear this sucking sound. I could hear like the engine was breathing in unmetered air. And for those of you that don't know what that sounds like, pull a vacuum hose off of an engine, off of your engine, and listen to what that sounds like and, and get your ears trained to pick up on that noise because that is a dead giveaway of a vacuum leak at idle. And that's what I had. Used a flashlight and my ears and I was able to locate the air intake boot right here with a tear in it. And I'll bring it up in front of the camera so you guys can see. There we go. So our air intake boot's got a nice, nice tear, tear in it right there, okay? So problem fixed, right? Well, what do we always have to do after we replace a part, after we fix a problem? We need to verify our repair, right? It's no good to just clear the code, send the car down the road to the customer. And I'm glad I verified on this vehicle because this wasn't the only issue. I fixed the main issue, the big issue, but as I sat and watched my fuel trims at idle, I still saw them high. I still saw excessive oxygen going past my O2 sensors and my fuel trims going up. Now, if I would have ran this vehicle out, if I would have cleared the codes, the customer would have came back. At that point, the customer's upset, right? They're back for a check engine light on. They don't know why. They just know that it's still on. You pull the codes, a 171. At this point, and a 174. At this point, you tell the customer they have a lean condition on their vehicle, what are they gonna say? Well, didn't you just fix that? I'm not paying for that. So now, instead of being paid for your time to diagnose it and replace the parts or whatever it needs, you're now having to eat this repair. So verification is super important. Now this is a two-step or two-piece intake boot on this BMW. And what I found as I was trying to verify my own repair was that I had another problem. And I'll show you guys right here. This one was a lot less noticeable. I had to move the boot around to get it to act up. Look at that. Okay. So the only way I noticed this is through verification of the repair. And a lot of you guys might say, well, shouldn't you have noticed that on your initial inspection? You know, you were looking down there with a flashlight. Well, let me show you first of all where this thing sits. I got a picture of it. 
And here's our mass airflow sensor. And it goes down, there's a hose that goes in here, and here is that little elbow right there that had the tear in it. And that other piece was right here where it was torn, okay? So being a technician, what did I do? I went after the problem, the main problem that was there, and that was this big, this big old tear right here. Replaced that part, verified my repair, and found out that I was still in trouble. I still had an issue. But I didn't run the vehicle out at that point because I knew I needed another part or something else wrong with it. Diagnosed it the rest of the way and fixed it. So it's just kind of a little story, guys, that first of all, you don't need to have all this fancy equipment. I know we have a lot of equipment that you guys out there don't have. Um, you do it yourself or guys out there don't have picoscopes. You don't have a nine to ten thousand dollar Varus. Um, you don't have all this at your disposal. I can guarantee to you guys that you could have diagnosed this BMW with a hundred dollar with our hundred dollar GoTech um, dongle and smartphone app and a flashlight in your ears. That's all it would have taken to diagnose this car. And it's a BMW. It's a European car that a lot of people are afraid to work on. So don't shy away from these things when they come into your shop, okay? Because uh, you're just letting money go out the door. Um, verification. Let's, I did take a video of verification of this repair. Bring it up on the screen here. Again, this is just with my phone taking a video of this thing. I'm going to skip ahead, um, pause it here for a second. You can see we're in open loop right now. Vehicle's running 932 RPM, and our coolant temp is cold right now. We're getting warm. Let this play out. Our O2 sensors aren't really functioning yet. Not doing too much. And eventually here, as this thing warms up a little more and our O2 sensors start to function, we should enter into our closed loop fuel control. There we go. We just entered closed loop. And here's our long terms, 11.7 on both banks. And a uh, little bit of, little bit of uh, not trivia, but maybe just a little tip here. This is a straight six engine. It does have two banks and four oxygen sensors, okay? It splits it up, the first three cylinders and the back three cylinders. Now this 3.5 liter straight five engine right here only has one bank, okay? So our BMW has two, and I'm gonna use air quotes, banks, because it's not like a V motor that's got a bank on either side. This would be a bank of three cylinders and a bank of three cylinders, okay? Now, similar, let's uh, talk about the GM 4.2 liter motor, straight six. That is only a single bank motor, right? Only one oxygen sensor in that exhaust manifold. This beamer behind us has two manifolds, two upstream oxygen sensors. That is why, on our data, we are getting bank one and bank two fuel trims right here, okay? So I'm gonna let this play out, and you guys can already see when we went into closed loop, look at our short terms. Very, very negative, okay? I'll skip ahead. They're starting to get a little bit better. And our O2 sensors seem to be responding like they're supposed to. Now, at this point, guys, I would clear the codes. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any way to reset the fuel trims on here. I can reset the codes with a, with a push of a button underneath our OBD2 uh, generic mode. I can clear the codes, but I can't clear these fuel trims. So what I would do at this point is you could potentially disconnect the battery, touch the terminals together of the cables, uh, excuse me, touch the cables together, not the terminals, the cables together. That could possibly reset the memory, but being on a BMW, I don't know if there's modules that need to be provisioned or set up. I don't know if the radio will go into an anti-theft lockout mode, so I'm not pulling the cables. I would take this thing out, clear the codes, and drive it. Watch those field trims and watch them correct. Just like that question that we had was it back in January or February where I asked you guys if long terms and short terms are opposite consistently, what does that potentially mean? That means the vehicle is trying to correct itself. Now we saw on our GTO last class that the long terms corrected very quickly. For whatever reason, BMWs don't correct as fast. I ran this thing for two or three minutes and our long terms were still at 11.7, okay? Give it some time, let the vehicle correct itself to verify your repair. But that being said, Verification is very important, and don't be afraid of the European models, okay? All right, let me just see. <laughs> just seeing what you guys uh, are talking about on here. Holy cow, there's a lot of comments already. We'll get to those in a minute. Let's jump into 
this Chevy Colorado. I'm gonna set this stuff off to the side. Thanks, Fritz. Yep. We'll set it off to the side so I got more room. Okay, Colorado. This is one of those vehicles that uh, started out as a head scratcher. And that's why we have it here today is because I wanna share with you what we did. So this vehicle, the story is customer complaint, intermittent check engine light, comes on, goes off, comes on, goes off, been to multiple shops, they don't seem to be able to fix it. He did tell me that when the check engine light was on, he stopped in at a parts store, had the code scanned, and it had a P0171 lean code in there. Good to know, our engine is running lean. This thing came in today, I do not have a check engine light on. Let's just take a peek, I have it hooked up with the key on right now. Let's just verify that we don't have any codes. I'm gonna display codes, all of our codes. We have none present. And no history codes. Uh, no failed designation. Uh, let's just see if we have any freeze frames. And I I'd assume that I'm not gonna have freeze frames because I have no codes. And nothing, okay. So vehicle came in, history from the customer is a lean code but it's not acting up right now. So do we ship it out the door and say, well, we're just another one of those shops that can't diagnose it? That's not good business practice. That's not going to A, make a good name for you, or B, make money for you. There's potential to make money in this diagnosis, okay? That's how we make money in a shop. We diagnose vehicles and we fix vehicles. So what do we do? Well, I would start by trying to verify the problem. Data display, engine data, and let's just look at all of our PIDs. I'm gonna have Fritz go ahead and fire this thing up in just a second. I wanna just look at what we're looking at, key on, engine off. And again, I'm looking for a couple different things like we talked about during the GTO class. Looking at coolant temp, intake air temp, our barrel, making sure that everything looks pretty good. Everything seems normal, right? Just from this, and actually this is interesting right here. Long-term fuel trim, zero. Remember that long-term fuel trim should be stored in the computer, it's a learned value. It should be stored key on engine off. Short term is always gonna read zero key on engine off. Long term will be stored, but we have zero right here. So I'm gonna have Fritz, you wanna go ahead and fire this thing up for me? And we're gonna look at this thing at idle and see what we have going on. See if we can figure out the problem by looking at scan tool data without a code currently. Go ahead. All right. Intake air temp. 84 degrees, coolant temp 129. We should see this consistently raise until the cooling fans kick in. Grams per second's a little high right now, but so is our RPM. The engine's a little cold. It's going through initial startup. We're in open loop. Again, our fuel trims aren't gonna do anything until we're into closed loop. There, we're in closed loop. TP looks normal. Engine load, 4%, looks pretty normal. And right now, everything is looking pretty good. Our mass airflow sensor seems slightly high, but I bet as this thing warmed up and the idle comes down a little bit further, we would see that come right back into where we want to. Uh, typically for an idle spec, you wanna see, rule of thumb here, roughly engine displacement. So a 3.5 liter, we wanna see roughly 3.5 grams per second, and that'll vary depending on temperature and barrel and humidity and everything that day, and it'll vary on idle RPM. There's gonna be some variance, but we wanna see it roughly around there. If we saw 15 grams per second at idle or 30 grams per second at idle, I would be a little bit worried at that point. But right now we are currently at right around five. We're looking pretty good here. All right, so our long term is at two. Short term is hovering the zero mark. Looks good. So our engine idling seems pretty good. We don't have any issues at this point. So what do we do? Slam down the hood, run it out, say, Sorry, we couldn't fix it today. Bring it back when the light's on? Again, is that good business practice? Is that going to get us paid for working on this vehicle today? No, it's not. So what do we do next? Fritz, you wanna go ahead and rev this thing up for me? We're gonna bring this thing up to, let's go up to 2000 RPM. And again, we're looking at all of our data. Our map sensor uh, vacuum goes down. Our trims still look good. You want to come up to three?
Okay. That's good. That's good. So what did we just see here? In my opinion, a whole lot of nothing. We ran this thing up, and you can go ahead and shut it off, Fritz. We ran this thing up in park at idle, 2,000 and 3,000 RPM, and our fuel trims seem to be pretty normal. Um, our oxygen sensors seem to be switching. I could have thrown them in, in graph mode for you, but uh, right now the thing seems pretty normal. So again, what do we do? Slam the hood, run it out, say we can't fix it, or maybe try one more step, right? We're only five minutes into this thing right now, really, if, if you weren't having to explain this <laughs> along the way. Um, drive it. Take this thing down the road. We know fuel trim issues can happen at idle or under load. And when the vehicle's sitting here in park and we're revving it up, we're not really putting it under a ton of load. The engine's not working that hard. But if we put this thing down into drive and we give her, get on that throttle, that's gonna put this engine under a ton of load, we might be able to see what happened. And that's exactly what we did next. And now, I can't get in the vehicle and drive it with you guys, but I did record the data from this motor. Let's take a peek here. So we'll pull this up as it loads. You can see I selected nine different PIDs here. I have RPM, throttle position, engine load percentage, mass airflow grams per second, map voltage, O2 sensor bank one, sensor one, O2 sensor bank two, uh, bank one, sensor two, short term and long term fuel trims, okay? I'm gonna hide this and so you guys can see this. Now, look at our long term max, 18, short term max, 37 positive. So what is this telling me? At some point when this engine was going down the road during our tests that we were doing during our drive cycle on this, we got this engine to run lean. So let's figure out when it happened. Okay, here we go. Let's look at throttle position first of all. So you can see we're kind of cruising down the road, you know, not very much throttle, not very fast in RPM, but here we go wide open throttle to the board. We peg this thing. This is going to be the hardest working moment of the engine. We're going to expect this thing to just be given fuel, given uh, air flowing in. It's our highest load point um, for this engine. So let's take a peek. Let's zoom in a little bit here and see what we're looking at. Okay, so wide open throttle, 100% right here. Our mass airflow grams per second is increasing. We have 105 currently grams per second of air flowing in. Our load currently 55%. Look at our O2 sensor. And by the way, I want to call out these uh, field trims first. These will typically be around zero on wide open throttle. And the reason why that is is because we kick out a closed loop and go to open loop at this point. Many of you know open loop fuel control, wide open throttle, we should expect to see what out of our O2 sensor. Our O2 sensor should do what on wide open throttle open loop fuel control. We should see this thing go rich. Our O2 sensor should switch completely rich at this point. Look at our O2. Bank one sensor, one O2 sensor. I'll zoom in a little more. Wide open throttle, throttle position 100%, map sensor voltage 4.9, so our throttle is wide open, vacuum in the engine is almost non-existent. Look at our O2. She's pegged lean. That thing is as low as low can be we have an excessive amount of oxygen going past that sensor. That's a big clue for us, right? So we're flowing air into our engine. That's being measured by our mass airflow sensor. And then we're applying fuel based on that calculation of air, applying fuel to that, going into our cylinder, exploding, going past our O2 sensor and telling us what it's doing. We should know at this point that our, we should expect to see our O2 sensor to go extremely rich at this point. Open loop, wide open throttle, fuel control, rich. We're doing the exact opposite. What is that telling me? It's telling me that we have a fuel delivery problem. There's something going on where we're not getting enough fuel. We're getting excess oxygen. And the computer's got no way to vary the amount of oxygen entering into the engine. That's what your throttle, or the, that's what your foot is doing on the throttle, right? You push that pedal to the floor, that throttle plate goes flat. You have air flowing into that intake manifold as fast as it can. What is the computer's job? to give you the correct amount of fuel to go with that amount of air. And right now, we definitely have an issue. We are running very, very lean. Let's look for some other clues in this data. This isn't our only clue. Our next clue, engine load percentage. 
Now there's no transmission codes, this tranny's not slipping. Um, there's nothing else going on with the transmission on here. Our engine load is gonna tell us how hard our engine is working. Now engine load is a percentage, and a percentage means it's part of 100%, part of a whole. And what exactly is that whole? What exactly is load? According to an engineer, load percentage is equal to current airflow divided by peak airflow at wide open throttle at a standard temperature being 25 degrees Celsius. So what this is pretty much saying is that our 100% mark of load is the ideal or the peak amount of power this motor can put out, okay? So wide open throttle mashed to the boards, you should be able to hit 100% load. In theory, that is the max that this motor can put out. According to our data here, at max, when this engine should be able to put out 100% load, we're only peaking at 76%. There's something going on here. This lean condition is causing us to not be able to get as much load, right? We don't have as much power. And when we drove this thing, from experience, we noticed that it seemed to be lacking power, especially on the higher RPM. And the reason the customer didn't notice it was because it's just, just like a wheel bearing problem, right? How many times have you guys gotten into a vehicle and said, whoa, what is going on with this wheel bearing? It's so noisy. Same thing with this. It happened so gradually over time, the customer never noticed the problem. All they noticed was the check engine light coming on intermittently. But that is not our only clue. We have another clue in here. Let's take a peek at our grams per second. Mass airflow, grams per second, at peak, 100% throttle, engine lean, load high, peak grams per second, 148.6 grams per second, okay? I could ask 100 different people out there, what is this thing supposed to put out? How many grams per second? And let's see, I know we're at like a 30 second delay here, guys, but how many grams per second should this motor put out? And we'll see if you guys uh, comment in it all here. How many grams per second should a 3.5 liter under wide open throttle put out? Or, or measure, or how much air should this thing breathe? And uh, we'll give it a few seconds here to see if you guys um, comment in. Do, 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 do. Just reading through the comments as we're going here. You guys are very talkative today. I'm loving it. Holy cow, I got a lot to read. Ah, all right. <laughs> oh, Pico Boo, you beat me to it. I was going to end the class today with May the 4th be with you. Darn, beat me to it. Oh, the humming is done. They stopped digging for the moment. Maybe they're taking their lunch break. Okay, so nobody has commented in yet on the uh, grams per second. And my thought behind that is because nobody knows. I don't know. Fritz, do you know? Not off the bat. There's really no spec that you're going to find for grams per second because there's really no exact number for it. Now, I've done some reading and I've done some research, and I found this little tidbit of information that I thought was interesting. And let me know, guys, if you use this. I heard and read that at wide open, peak throttle, peak load, peak everything, the grams per second should be equivalent to roughly 80% of the vehicle's horsepower. Let me know what you guys think on this. I've done some testing. I have not done enough to say it's definitive at this point, but let's just do it on this vehicle. So I'm gonna open up our calculator here. And uh, okay, so right now, what are we sitting at? 148.6.6, and we're going to divide this by 80%. This should give us our peak horsepower number. 185.75, according to this rule of thumb that I found, is supposed to be how much horsepower this 3.5 liter puts out. So, trusty Google, let's find out what this thing, um, let's go like this, 2004 Chevy Colorado, 3.5 liter, horsepower. Let's see what we got here. And of course it's not going to come up nice and easy like it did for me before. Let's see what we have. 
Uh, horsepower at 5,600 RPM. This thing is supposed to have 220 horse. 185? 220. All right, let's go back to our scan tool. 146 grams per second. 185 horse or 220 horse. It's just, it's off right now, right? We're missing something. Something isn't right. So do we have a fuel delivery problem? Do we have a airflow problem? What is going on with this thing? Well, we kind of already have a good idea, but there's a couple ways we can prove it out, right? So we know our engine's going lean under high RPM. If our air filter were plugged up, if this thing is only breathing 145 grams per second when it's supposed to be higher, if it's only breathing 145 grams per second into our motor, at that point, fuel is going to control for that, right? So if we're accurately measuring air, we're accurately adding fuel, we should see a good mixture. And especially under load, we should see that thing be able to go rich. Okay. If there was restricted exhaust, a plug cat, something like that, we would expect this thing to be rich almost all the time. Back pressure, not allowing the exhaust to get out of the cylinder, less room in the cylinder for oxygen. So we don't have a plugged up air filter, we don't have plugged up exhaust, could we potentially have a fueling issue, fuel volume, fuel uh, pressure? Maybe, but from my experience and my, let's call it laziness, I don't want to hook up a fuel pressure gauge to this. There's no Schrader valve on here. I don't want to be disconnecting the fuel rail. I don't want to do any of that work. I'm currently driving down the road watching my data PIDs. I'm not going to pull over and pull a, a fuel pressure gauge out of my pocket. It's just not going to happen. I want to find something easier. And that's what I did. I unplugged the mass airflow sensor. So this isn't going to work on every single vehicle. They don't all have strategy for running without a mass airflow sensor, but fortunately enough for us, this one does. So we unplug the mass airflow sensor. What happens? We go into essentially a speed density system that's using the MAP sensor to judge um, our airflow. So right here, you guys can see this entire point here is with the mass airflow disconnected, okay? Let's look at a peak condition, wide open throttle. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to zoom us in. 100% throttle, zero on our load, zero on our grams per second because we're unplugged. Our MAP sensor, reading nice and high voltage. Look at our O2 sensor. Look at that. Our O2 sensor is rich, just like it's supposed to. So our air is flowing into the engine. The engine says, okay, we are wide open throttle. I'm going open loop and I'm going to dump fuel into this thing. So what did we just prove right here? This engine is capable to run rich under full load, under full wide open throttle. So we don't have a fuel pressure issue. We don't have a fuel volume issue. I didn't hook a gauge up, but I know this now because I was able to make this engine rich when we're at that wide open throttle mark. So at this point, since I've disconnected the mass airflow sensor and the engine is now running better, I can feel a significant gain in power and responsiveness. I'm thinking mass airflow sensor, right? It's a, it's a logical thing. So pull over to the side of the road, plug the mass airflow sensor back in, and let's see what happened. Let's just say we're gonna look at it one more time. I'm gonna pull up another wide open throttle event after the mass airflow was plugged back in. So what we did, we pulled over to the side of the road, shifted her up into park, went out, popped the hood, plugged the mass airflow in, went back down the road back to the shop, okay? 148 grams per second, same number. 77% load, 1% higher load. But look, 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 look. Our O2 sensor's rich now. Did we just fix this problem by unplugging the connector and plugging it back in? Do we have a resistance problem or a pin tension problem or some green fuzzies inside the connector that we just cleaned up? It might be easy to think that. But we got to remember what we've done here. We unplugged a sensor while the engine was running. What would that do? It would set a code. What happens when we set a code? The computer ignores it. Now, we pull this thing over to the side of the road, put her in park, plug it back in. We get readings on our scan tool, right? We have load. We have grams per second. But the computer says, I'm smart. I saw a code. I'm not going to trust that sensor until I can verify it. And apparently, for this vehicle, requires a key cycle or 
a clearing of the codes. The computer will not trust our mass airflow sensor until it's seen one of those two things happen. And that is why we are rich with our mass airflow reading here. We didn't fix any problems. We're getting fooled here. The computer's fooling us. It's telling us we have these here, but the computer's not looking. It's blind. It's blind to our mass airflow and our load because it saw the code. It still has the code in there. We haven't cleared the code. We haven't key cycled. Okay? So our mass airflow sensor is faulty, and it has created our problem, and the computer decided to ignore it when we plugged it back in. So bring it in the shop, slap a new mass airflow in, and we're good to go, right? I would say so, and that's actually what ended up fixing this. But it's up to you at this point, what do you want to do? Do you want to clean the mass airflow, or do you want to replace it? And I leave this choice up to my customer. It's, at the end of the day, it's the customer's money. I give them a quote for cleaning the mass airflow, and I give them a quote for replacing it. This customer decided to replace. So I pulled the mass airflow, and I got some nice pictures here. Um, in fact, let me just pull it out here. Actually, do we want to see how this one works first? Maybe we should do that. I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Too much coffee this morning. Let's show you guys how this thing works before we pull it out and replace it. That way we can see before and after. So this is a GM hot wire sensor. Oops. And it's got two sensor elements and they're two resistor elements essentially that are meant to maintain a certain temperature. So we have current flowing into there, heating these elements up and they're supposed to maintain a certain temperature. Air rushes past, cools down our sensor elements and then the um, computer responds. The sensor responds. The smart sensor puts out a digital signal out of the sensor to tell the computer the airflow, to the calculated airflow from the sensor. So we have air rushing past, cooling down our elements, increases current. The sensor does some calculations, puts out a frequency signal. So let's look at that with a scope because why not? We're here to train. We're not here to... Uh, I'm not flat rate right now, put it that way. I, at this point, I'd be throwing a sensor in it, but I want to show you guys how they work so that you can apply it to different vehicles. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to unplug this thing. Fritz, is the key off right now? It's off. Okay. I'm going to unplug this sensor. I want to show you guys the signal circuit with it unplugged. And there we go. It's in my hand. Fritz, go ahead and turn this thing on. Turn the key on. Look at our scope. Key on, on the signal circuit, we are currently reading volts. Okay, let's look at the diagram. Go back here, let's pull up our diagram. This is our wiring diagram. Our intake air temp and mass airflow sensor right here is one unit, powered up by our 15 amp uh, ERLS fuse into ignition one voltage into our sensor. IAT is over here on pin E and D with PCM direct inputs. Then we have uh, pin A here, yellow wire. That's what I'm back probed in right now. That is our signal wire and pin B is our ground wire. So many of us, and myself included, I thought when I were to scope this thing, with it unplugged, I would see zero volts because I thought the sensor would send out the signal and send out the voltage, but that's not the case. The sensor's job in this specific application, it pulls that voltage down to ground, creating our frequency. That's why on key on right now, we are sitting at five volts, okay? Now, I'm gonna have Fritz key off, and I'm gonna wait until the key, uh, until the um, computer goes to sleep. You wanna go back to the scope? So Fritz just turned our key off, and we're still sitting at five volts. And after a few seconds here, the PCM should kill the power to that. Do, 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 there we go. So we're at zero volts now. I'm gonna plug this bad boy back in. All right, so she's plugged back in now, nice and tight. And this is still the old, old uh, faulty sensor. Fritz, go ahead and turn our key back on. And immediately we have a signal. We have a digital frequency signal. And looks kind of cool, nice neat square wave, zero to five volts, which we would have expected, right? The computer sent out five volts and our sensor is gonna pull it to ground. So what should we do now? Let's fire this thing up, show them how it moves. Go ahead, Fritz. So what I would expect to see is this signal kind of tighten up or our frequency increase with RPM. So I'm gonna actually bring our scope down a little bit. So we're at one millisecond right now. Go ahead and rev it up, Fritz. And again. Okay. 
Good. All right, you can shut it off for a second. So we saw our frequency increase. We saw what it's supposed to do. More air rushes in, goes past that hot wire, cools it down, and our frequency increases. But to me, I don't really know what the heck that just meant because I'm not, I can't measure frequency in my head that fast. You could throw a meter on it, put your meter in frequency, put it on there and you'll get a number. Or we can throw our scope into frequency. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll set this thing up for frequency. Right here we have AC, DC, or frequency. I'm going to throw it in there and go to 20 kilohertz. Now I'll go ahead and fire this thing up. And this is just noise right now. Go ahead. And now we have an idea of what we're looking at. So right now we're at 3.137 kilohertz for our mass airflow sensor frequency. I'm going to bump up our time scale. I'm going to go to one second per division. Go ahead and hit the gas a couple times, Fritz. All right, I'll stop it there. And you guys can see what happens here. Our frequency goes up, right? We have a peak here at 5.9 and another peak here at 6.3, 6.24. All right, put this thing down to the, down to the red line, Fritz. All right, that's good, you can shut it off. So right now, our mass airflow sensor is peaking frequency 7.391. Um, let's zoom in a little. Come on. There we go. Uh, just under 8. So we'll call it 8 kilohertz peak frequency of this sensor. So that is the signal that is being grounded by the sensor, telling the PCM how much air is flowing past. OK? And to prove out that this thing actually functions with current, I'm going to stick a current clamp, an amp clamp, around our power wire. Because what we'll see here is that this thing is actually using current to keep those wires hot. OK, so I got our amp clamp on, zeroed. I'm going to turn our scope back on here. I'm going to turn on channel B. I'm going to throw a 60 amp clamp on there in 20 amp mode, maybe. Oh, now I'm throwing everything off. 20 amp mode, I'm going to turn it on. Let's go 0 to 500 milliamps. And we have a mess right now. But uh, go ahead and start this thing up, Fritz. And I have our amp clamp on backwards. OK. Let me zero it out first. All right. So now we can see a nice messy signal here. I'm going to throw in some filtering. See if we can clean that up. I'm sure there's a way to clean this up, guys. If you know, let me know. Um, but anyways, this is our current right now going into the sensor on our ignition one, ignition one voltage right now. And uh, okay, rev it up all the way down to the boards just once or twice. All right, you can shut it off. So what you guys can see here on the screen is mirror images, right? Our frequency goes up, our current goes up. Now, I don't know what exactly this current means, I, and I don't think it's really of any value. I just wanted to show you guys that this is a hot wire sensor that increases current draw to keep those wires warm, and it's going to mirror your frequency. So just wanted to be able to show you guys that. I don't know of any time when I would use a current clamp to diagnose a mass airflow sensor. But being that this is a training environment, I just wanted to show you guys that what that would look like, OK? All right, let's get to the mass airflow now. Now that we've talked about it enough, I think it's time to show you guys what I got here. So I'm going to pull this one out. And now this vehicle does have 100,000 miles on it. And this is the original sensor. So I got it in my hand here, and I'm going to inspect it. And immediately. I can see with my naked eye that there is an issue inside of here. I will show you guys, because I could put it in front of the camera here for you guys, but I don't think you're going to see it. It's kind of hard to tell. Maybe you can see it. OK. I can do one better. I have access to a microscope and took some snapshots of this thing. So here is our sensor elements at 20 times magnification. Here's the two resistor elements, and look at the crap stuck on them. All that crud stuck on there. We'll go one step further. 50 times magnification. 
Look at that. That's one of the elements, and there's the other one. 100 times magnification. Now you can really see it easily. There's a bunch of stuff stuck on here. Here's our resistor wire, that black line that's going across here. That's our resistor wire that's in there. It's going to be as thin as a hair, potentially even thinner. I don't know the actual diameter, but it is very, very, very small. Here's our other one at 100 times. And just for scale, guys, I took a picture at 100 times of some dirt that I picked up on the ground. Okay, I just put my finger down on the ground like this and went like that over the, uh, where the microscope was sitting at 100 times. These look like boulders, right? That looks like a boulder compared to what we're seeing on here. This stuff is microscopic. I mean, we're zoomed in at 100 times on there. Your air filter does a good job. As long as you keep it changed and, and maintained regularly, it gets down to the micron level. It is supposed to maintain and keep that sensor from getting dirty. But we have a hot sensor. We have stuff flowing past it. Over time, it is eventually going to become dirty. Okay? So again, the sensor is in either need of cleaning or in need of replacement. And like I said, I leave that up to my customer because at the end of the day, it's their money that I'm spending, I guess. So you could clean this one or replace it. The customer chose to replace it. So I threw a new one in, and I'll do that right now. Here's the new one. We'll put that in, nice and clean, good to go. Throw in our screws. And thank goodness GM has some nice hex head screws in this thing or bolts in this thing. Not like some mass airflow sensors, I'm sure you guys are familiar with them being tamper-proof Torx or tamper-proof Torx filled with epoxy or who knows. Who knows what your mass airflow is connected by. And typically the reason why that's done is so that you don't clean the sensor. The manufacturer is trying to keep you from cleaning the sensor. That's the long and short of it. So new sensors in. Now what I did was I got two new sensors. I put one in the vehicle and then I took some snapshots of the other one. Here's it brand new, right out of the box. That's what the element looks like, nice and shiny. You can see the wire in there. Let's, that, that sensor element's got a coating on it, right? Let's think of it like Teflon on a pan. It's supposed to help things from, to keep from sticking to it, right? That's what's making this thing shiny, is that coating that's over it, okay? And that coating is what helps prevent things sticking to it and helps um, secure the longevity of the sensor. So what I did is I took this new sensor out of its box and I cleaned it three different times. First time, with a can of mass airflow sensor cleaner. Meant for mass airflows, right? It says right on the can. Sprayed it down, looks great. Nice and shiny still. It actually looks better than when I pulled it right out of the box. It got the little dust particles off of it. Looks great. I'm happy with mass airflow cleaner. I went one step further. Brake clean. Looks great. Nice and shiny. No dust on it, nothing on it, looks good. And again, this was on the brand new sensor. And then I went one step further, carb cleaner. Now this is a little bit different. Look at this, see that, 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 that right there, these little spots here. Let's get it a little closer up. 200 times magnification, look at that. There, there. Now guys, this is not droplets of any liquid on there. That's not water on there. That's not anything on there that I put on there. I sprayed the sensor down and let it dry off on its own. A few minutes later, put it under microscope, okay? These are impregnated into the, the, the seal or the coating that's on there. And look at, right here, I thought this was interesting. It's actually raised up. See that? See how it's kind of raised up over the edge there? Our coating has been, the, the, the carb cleaner got into the coating and bubbled it. At this point, I would not be installing the sensor on a vehicle because it could potentially fail in a shorter life expectancy and end up causing you problems. So brake clean, mass airflow sensor cleaner seem to be just fine. Carb clean, don't use it on your mass airflow. Now, I do want to clean this one and I'm going to. Um, I do have another class coming up at two o'clock this afternoon, so I'm not going to clean it yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clean it after that class. I'm going to clean it with mass airflow cleaner, put it under the microscope, and I'm going to show you guys those pictures in the Tech Connect episode that is coming up uh, at the end of the month. I also have another one of these, very similar, out of a different vehicle, same thing, dirty mass airflow sensor. I'm going to clean that one with brake clean, and we're going to compare them side by side in our Tech Connect episode, okay? So be watching out for that. You'll be able to see what this exact sensor right here looks like cleaned with mass airflow sensor cleaner. Okay, what else do we got here? Well, I harped on you guys about verification of the repair, so why don't we go ahead and verify our repair 
with the sensor. Let's first of all do it with the scope and let's see what our peak uh, frequency is. I saved this screenshot here, guys. You can see this is where we just were. Peak frequency is 6.8, uh, 7.3, 7.1. So I think we saw right around 8 kilohertz um, before. Let's see what our new one does. So I got this on. I'm going to actually turn off channel 2 because I don't really care about that current. Um, go ahead, Fritz, fire this thing up. Let's see what she does at idle. 3,000 kilohertz. So that's the same. That's where it was before. All right, go ahead and put her down to the boards. Again. Go again, yep. All right. That's good, you can shut it off. So it sounded like it revved up even higher, and here's proof, 8.3. And 8 point, let's zoom in, 8.4, almost 8.5 kilohertz. So we got 500 more hertz out of this thing, right? So our sensor is more accurately reading. But don't take my word for it that this fixed it. What I would do now is I would go out with the scan tool and drive this thing, right? I mean, we got it to act up under heavy, heavy throttle, wide open, open loop field control. So that's what we did. And I got a screenshot or snapshot of the data from that. So it's going to look very similar. Here we have the same information, same PIDs. And let's look at a wide open event. So here, 100% throttle position. Look at this already, right here, guys. Peak. 99% load, giveaway, beautiful. That's what I like to see, 99% load. Look at our grams per second peak, 185.64. Hmm, that 80% rule might actually be taking effect. Let's, uh, let's zoom in on this. Well, what do you think? Wide open throttle, what is our O2 sensor doing? What are we verifying right now? The engine is able to go rich. We go into open loop, and I'm sorry, I wish I would have had that loop PID on here, but I didn't. Um, we go into open loop, we dump fuel down this thing. We are now accurately measuring that mass amount of air that's coming into the engine, and we are accurately supplying fuel with it. This engine needed a mass airflow sensor. It was filthy, it was old, it had 100,000 miles on it. We proved it by looking at load, grams per second, and our O2 sensors under wide open, heavy load throttle, okay? This can be applied to not just a frequency output mass airflow sensor like this GM one. You could do this with an analog style sensor too. Um, you might want to watch voltage or something like that on a sensor like that. Or if it does have a grams per second PID, you could watch that as well. But uh, let me know what you guys think with that 80% of your horsepower uh, rule of thumb. Um, I'm not convinced yet. I haven't done enough testing with it yet. But if you guys use that, let me know. I'm curious. Um, so yeah, we fixed the car. We uh, went from a no check engine light, just a history of a code, um, lack of power. Not only did we fix this vehicle, potentially gain a customer for life because we fixed this vehicle after it was in different shops, but we profited from it today. We diagnosed the car driving down the road. We didn't waste a bunch of time checking fuel. We didn't waste a bunch of time pulling the, looking for intake gasket leaks. We picked a path and we went down it and by having some experience and some knowledge about the way the system should operate, we were able to diagnose this thing in, if I was doing this down the road, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, that's all it took. Most of you guys charge at least an hour for Diag. We made money on the Diag, we make money on the part or cleaning of the part. At the end of the day, it's a money win for us, it's a customer win for us, we gain a customer, and everybody's happy, and you can pat yourself on the back for diagnosing a problem that was to a different shop that somebody else looked at. So that is going to be it for the Colorado. Um, I'm going to look at all these comments that you guys have been sending in here. And let's see what we got. <laughs> Holy cow. I don't even think I can answer all these right now. All right. Right now it is 11.55. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes here to send in any questions of anything that you maybe want to see that I could demonstrate in the shop yet. It's kind of a Q&A session. Um, somebody had given me the idea in the comment section of the survey, so I want to try it. 
is there anything that you guys want me to hook up right now that you want to see or any data PIDs that you want to see with this engine with the new mass airflow sensor in there or anything that you wanted to know? Let me know right now. I'm going to watch the bottom of the comments here and um, see what you guys have to say, okay? Um, the problem with using horsepower for mass airflow is that horsepower changes according to state of tune and wear. True, true. Could the tune, a tune affect it? Yes, but if you tune the engine, would it not then have a higher 100% value for calculated load? Would you not tune the, the, the highest functioning load? Would a tuned engine be if you didn't tune that, would you see 125% load or something like that? I would think, and I'm not proficient on engine tuning by any means, but I would assume that whoever's tuning the engine would set up the load percentage 100% peak, this is what you need, would be set up with the, uh, with the new tune, okay? Let's see here. Disregard any comments about my yoga pants. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Ozstar, you're wearing yoga pants to work or something? I'm going to have to look in there and see, uh, see what you're talking about here. Um, a lot of people saying measure, oh, measure mass airflow volts at wide open throttle. Sure. Um, Liam, Kala zero, uh, 20, uh, Liam Kala 29, what about those high spikes? Leo, are you talking about on the, um, are you talking about these spikes right here? This one here, and sometimes you'll see them over here. What I've been told is that this is a inaccuracy of the scope. I've been told this is, I think it was referenced as aliasing of the scope, something like that. The scope is, is misreading this, um, is what I've been told. Now, if you guys know any better, if there's a better way that I could set up this scope, that I could avoid this, please let me know. I'd be really interested to find that out. But uh, right now, I've been disregarding these spikes because they're inconsistent, and the vehicle does not have any problems with the new sensor. Uh, measure mass airflow volts at wide open throttle, around 4 volts. Um, Bax Rock 2, measuring the mass airflow at wide open throttle, around 4 volts. What exactly are we measuring what wire are you on are you talking on the input wire from the fuse because I would assume that to be 12 volts um, or are you talking voltage on that signal wire coming out of the um, out of the mass airflow because this is a digital digital sensor putting out a value if we looked at voltage at wide open throttle on our signal wire I would expect to see a very very fast frequency from 0 to 5 volts now if this was a I don't know, a Ford sensor where they're more of an analog varying voltage sensor, you could watch voltage, but I'm not quite seeing exactly, I'm not quite understanding exactly if why you would want to look at voltage on this sensor, but you know what, I'll do it. We are currently back probed on the signal wire. I'm going to change the scope over to voltage. Fritz, could you fire this thing up for me? So I'll put us down to the, we'll go Oops, sorry, not 50. Let's go 10. Better yet, let's go 5. Bring her down a little. Uh, let's go 10. Okay. So here is our voltage, and we're at a one second division. It'll, so it just looks like a mess. I'll bring it down. 5 milliseconds. We have a signal. 1 millisecond, we have a signal. I'm going to go back to one second where we were. Fritz, wide open throttle this thing for me. And again. OK, you can shut it off. So we're back probed on that signal wire, and our voltage really didn't change, right? Five, and I would assume this would just be some sort of discrepancy um, in the sensor. But what, what changed was that frequency of how fast that sensor was responding, from like 3,000 kilohertz all the way to Almost, uh, what, what were we looking at, 8,000, 8,000 plus? Look at how fast this is responding on those wide open marks. So I don't think looking at voltage on a digital signal style, frequency style sensor like this is efficient. 
All right. Explain the spike. Yes, uh, Chris is saying that he's thinking those spikes are glitches. I would agree those spikes are, are glitches. Um, min, max voltage, or frequency while doing snap throttle. You would want to be using frequency on your meter. If you're doing this with a voltmeter and you're measuring the signal on the sensor, you want to be using frequency on your, on your meter, not voltage. Um, but at the same time, guys, what is the point of measuring the frequency? Unless you have a like vehicle to compare it against or you have known good values, who's to say that that 8,000 or 7,000 or 6,000 kilohertz isn't proper for this vehicle? Unless I had another 04 with similar miles on it sitting right here, I don't know if that value is good or not. I got to trust what the computer is seeing and how it's supplying fuel. I got to trust my oxygen sensors at the end of the day. I don't know that by measuring frequency, it's going to tell us a lot. Besides the fact that the sensor's working and responding, which we already knew because we're getting grams per second, and we're not getting a mass airflow code, like a rationality code or something like that. Now, I want to bring up, I did pull up diagnostic info on the P0101 mass airflow sensor rationality code, and GM was nice enough to include a little bit of information under diagnostic aids. It says here, wide open throttle acceleration from stop should cause the mass airflow sensor parameter on the scan tool to increase rapidly. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, that um, brilliant piece of information there. But this next line is great. The increase should be from 3 to 6 grams per second at idle to 140 grams per second or more at the time of the 1-2 shift. If the increase is not observed, inspect for restriction in the induction system or the exhaust system. So they're giving us some specs there. GM was nice enough to tell us at idle, this thing should read 3 to 6 grams per second and wide open throttle at the time of the 1-2 shift, so full load, should be at least 140 grams per second. Now, this is the exact reason why our sensor never failed the rationality test, the P0101, because we're still reading 148 grams per second. Now, if we let this thing go, if this sensor was in here, say another, who knows, 5,000 miles, got some more dirt stuck to that sensor, now our peak at the 1-2 shift is only 138 grams per second, chances are we're going to fail the rationality test and set a P0101 code, OK? The reason we didn't set a PO 101 is because it was passing rationality that GM must be testing at 140 grams per second. Okay? Oh, we're back on yoga pants. Do not, yoga pants don't match the Wells hats. Uh, I remember this along with the other good info in this webinar. So yes, yoga pants and the Wells gear. Um, yeah, I'm not one for yoga pants. I don't know about you guys. I prefer wearing jeans. So, uh, all right, any other questions from you guys? Uh, Juan said in here, 100,000 miles time for spark plugs. This thing actually does have brand new spark plugs in it. Um, spikes are glitches, perfect. <laughs> but who really drives any Mazdas? Okay. Uh, volts, yeah, you're right. Bax Rock uh, 2 voltage was used definitely on early model Fords and uh, Mazdas, you would use voltage. Um, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, is what you guys, are, are you telling me here that our next t-shirt that we designed should fit along with yoga pants? Is that what you're wanting? I mean, should we do some Wells yoga pants? Is that what you guys want to see? Some, a Wells logo on a pair of some black stretchy yoga pants or what? Jeez. Uh, I'm just going to scroll up in the comments, see if there's anything else I should address right now. Um, if I missed your comment and you wanted to ask it one more time, please ask it right now. I will go back to the bottom and check it out. Um, but I have a lot to read through here, guys. Um, I will go through every single one of these comments and see what you guys are saying, and I will address all of this stuff in our Tech Connect episode, along with cleaning of this filthy mass airflow sensor to see what it looks like, and maybe talking about some other cool stuff. I don't know yet. We'll see what that, uh, how that goes down. Man, I'm just looking for that yoga pants comment up here, but I'm not seeing it. I want to know how this all started. All right, well, I'll find it later and have a good laugh, I'm sure. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, anything else? Let's see if there's anything else coming up down here from you guys. Um, <laughs> so we want yoga pants for our wives, I see. You know, I think I could get my wife in a pair of Wells yoga pants. That could probably happen. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Marvin received his hat yesterday. Good. I hope you're loving it. Um, I hope it fits good. And if you got a wife, hopefully she's hitting on you now because of the uh, the well swag that you're wearing there. 
Uh, <laughs> I don't think Bob wants any, any yoga pants. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to call it there, guys. I think we've, uh, I've taken enough of your time for today. You guys get back to work. I'm going to get set up for the next class at 2 o'clock. If you guys want to watch this again, definitely come join me. I will be live again in just under two hours. We're going to do the same thing again. So if you maybe miss something, um, you could watch this video again because it will be published right away out on YouTube or join us at 2 o'clock for that class. If you guys haven't taken the survey yet, please, please, please take the survey. I want feedback from you guys. It's only eight questions, super fast, takes two minutes. Um, let me know what you guys think. The survey is right below in the description of the video here. If you are out on our website watching, there's going to be a little YouTube link in the bottom right corner of the video when you mouse over it. Click on that. That'll take you out to YouTube, and then you'll see the description right below the video where you can click the survey link. It takes you out to SurveyMonkey. Please, please fill that out. Uh, like, share, follow the video. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I think that's all we're on right now. So follow us out there. We're always updating. Uh, we're always updating those things. Um, Bob said to tell him. Okay, I'll, as as some of you guys maybe know, and most of you probably don't. Um, I recently became a father. I am hopefully training up the next generation of automotive technician. My son was born April seventeenth. That's why we had to bump the Spanish video for those of you guys that watch it. So. It's going to be interesting to uh, hopefully be able to train him up through the years to maybe hopefully enjoy cars and enjoy fixing cars. So now you guys all know that uh, that information and um, why if sometime in the future if I have to reschedule a broadcast, that's probably why. But uh, hopefully training up the next generation of automotive technicians. So all right, that's going to be it for today, guys. Bring up my email one more time. If you haven't emailed me with the answer to the question, please do that. You can win one of our awesome, super cool hats or t-shirts of your choice. And um, there's my email on the screen. Question was, purge solenoid is stuck open. Tech A says rich uh, code. Tech B says lean code. Which is correct? Tech A, tech B, neither or both. Send me out that answer with the reason why they're correct. I need why. Otherwise, I'm not going not gonna to count it as correct. And um, good. I think that's it. So. That is going to be it today. Thank you guys for all the congratulations. He is happy and healthy, and my wife is happy and healthy as well. So thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And if you want, join me at 2 o'clock. Otherwise, I will see you for the Tech Connect episode at the end of the month. Check out our CounterPoint videos. They are more part-focused and installation-focused. And then uh, we'll see you guys on June 1st for the next class. The survey will be ending June 1st, and we will be drawing that winner of one of these awesome Wells Tech shirts, okay? So that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me for this hour and 10 minutes. Really appreciate it, and we'll see you guys again next time. Thank you.